Now, an interesting thing actually occurs whenever a uh, unstable uh, isotope goes through radioactive decay. It actually gives off energy. So, so what I mean by that, if you had a hunk of polonium-211, which is unstable, and you were to hold it, not the wisest decision, uh, then you would actually feel it to be warm. It would actually be giving off what you would perceive as heat. And, and that actually, that, that idea right there, that certain elements were all of a sudden, certain isotopes were suddenly or randomly warm for some odd reasons, actually kind of what led uh, many, many scientists like Madame Curie to, to, to the discovery of radiation. Now, if we were to kind of zoom in maybe on a single atom of polonium-211 from that hunk there to actually look at what's occurring, I have, I have polonium-211, and whenever it decays, remember half-life random and spontaneous, or excuse me, radiation random and spontaneous, can't predict for a single one when it's going to happen. Uh, half-life is only for a large quantity of them, uh, but whenever it does decay, my polonium-211 would decay into lead-207 and an alpha particle, which is a helium nucleus being shot away at high speeds. And so what's actually happening here is the polonium-211 is less stable and the lead and the helium are more stable. And the helium goes flying away uh, somewhere around 20% the speed of light, which is uh, quite, quite fast, actually. Um, where on Earth does that energy come from, you might ask. Um, if you notice the numbers for the, the nucleon number for the polonium and the lead and the helium actually add up 207 plus four gets you back to 211. And then if you wanted to look at the proton number, uh, 82 plus two gets me back to my 84. So we didn't actually destroy any particles. There isn't any weirdness happening there yet. There is a release of energy in the form of kinetic energy of my alpha particle, and those, th those alpha particles moving away at high speeds then bump into other particles, causing all the particles, all the molecules around the polonium-211 to start moving faster, which is what we perceive as, as thermal energy or, or heat. Now, the simple way to recognize where this energy comes from uh, that allows the alpha particle to go shooting off for us at a high speed is just to look at the energy difference. The polonium-211 nucleus actually has more energy uh, than our uh, lead and our helium nucleus. Really, I should say the amount of energy decreases in the nucleus going from the polonium to 11 to the lead and the helium, making it more stable. Now, a random aside, come back and uh, see me for a future lesson. Uh, it actually, uh, the, the binding energy, which is the type of energy inside the nucleus, is actually negative. In fact, all potential energies are negative. Um, and, and so what's actually happening is the lead and the helium, the, their binding energy is actually become more negative, making them more stable. That's not something we need to worry about right now. The thing that we just need to know for this lesson is simply that the polonium-211 has excess energy compared to the uh, lead and the helium, that, that they have, that the energy in the nucleus actually decreases whenever it goes through the decay. And that decrease in energy, the difference between them, is what comes out as the kinetic energy. Now, here's a cool thing. E equals mc squared. Um, energy equals mass times the speed of light squared. And oftentimes you hear this in terms of energy equals the mass destroyed times the speed of light squared. And that is true if you're doing like a matter-antimatter reaction, but that's not what's happening here. Um, Oftentimes, uh, whenever we deal with nuclear reactions and there's energy coming out, people uh, people mistakenly think we must be destroying a proton or a neutron. That, that's just not true. What we're actually doing is just releasing energy. But if we kind of reverse this, energy equals mass times the speed of light squared, and we generally are used to looking at, okay, maybe with antimatter we're destroying some mass and getting out some energy, but, but think about it the other way. Energy, according to this equation, must actually have a mass. Energy actually has a mass, which is kind of a cool thought whenever you think about that. So if you are running at a, at a high speed, you actually have a little bit extra mass because that kinetic energy that you have actually makes you a little bit heavier. So whenever you actually deal with masses of isotopes, like you're going to see these masses down here, those are called rest masses, meaning the mass whenever the, whenever the isotope is not uh, in motion, doesn't have, doesn't have kinetic energy. Now, to kind of get an idea, look at these masses. Polonium 
211 has a mass of 210.98, etc., etc. Went down all the way to six decimal places there. Lead has a mass of 206.9 and some stuff. And then my helium nucleus, the alpha particle, is going to have a mass of, of around four. But but if you can, if you add these two masses together, it is just slightly less than the mass of the polonium 211. In fact, if I subtract these guys, so, you know, I, I do the uh, reactant mass, the polonium-211, the reactant is the thing that you have, that you are putting in, so this, this would be my reactant. So if I subtract my reactant mass from my product mass, um, you might think, hey, this should turn out to be exactly the same, but it doesn't. Whenever you, whenever you type that all in, there is a very, very small mass defect, 0 0.008. Uh, 138 AMUs, standing for atomic mass units, or, or the mass of approximately one twelfth of a carbon twelve twelve atom, uh, which is which is about uh, one AMU is about the mass of a of a nucleon, a, a proton or a neutron. So so it's a very 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 small mass difference, yet it is there. Now, let me emphasize again, that mass difference didn't come from the fact that we destroyed any matter. All the particles that we had are still here. We still have the same number of neutrons and the same number of protons. The nucleon numbers add up, right? The proton numbers, they add up to equal out also. So we didn't destroy actually any matter here. What we actually did was release a little bit of the energy stored inside the nucleus. What we're actually doing is the amount of energy decreases in the nucleus whenever you have that decay. And energy has, has a mass to it. So whenever we are releasing some of the energy, the mass actually goes down. We end up with what's called a mass defect. And so for us in this case, whenever we're talking about a nuclear reaction, mass defect is just going to be the difference between the mass difference between the reactants and the products. Do your reactants minus your products over here. And that's that's the mass of the energy that you actually released. Energy actually has a value in terms of mass. Um, now, this it really isn't all that useful, right? We can we know these masses here. They, they were measured very, very precisely by scientists for us. Um, but, but that doesn't actually tell us that's the mass of the energy. Wouldn't it be a lot more useful to actually know the amount of energy? So um, instead of making you plug into E equals mc squared, which would be set as E in terms of joules, M in terms of kilograms, and C the speed of light squared, right, 3.0 uh, or, or 2.99 uh, times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Uh, instead of making you do that, we've kind of already done the conversions for you. One AMU so you don't even have to convert to kilograms, one AMU is worth 931.5 mega electron volts per the speed of light squared. That should have a negative sign up here per the speed of light squared. That should be in the denominator. Never mind that. Um, and if we wanted in base units of joules, one AMU is worth approximately 1.5 times 10 to the negative 10th joules. So what that means is if, if I want to ever figure out the amount of energy uh, that is actually released in one of the decays, I simply subtract the masses to find my mass defect. And once I find my mass defect, here it is up here, just simply multiply, if we're trying to get to joules, by 1.5 times 10 to the negative 10th. Now I'm setting that up with, with dimensional analysis to where the AMUs cancels out, but, but you're just going to end up multiplying by 1.5 times 10 to the negative 10th, uh, 10th joules, which would give me a uh, energy released, energy released of, in this case, 1.22 times 10 to the negative 12th joules. Now that might seem like an absolutely minuscule amount of energy, but whenever you recognize that uh, that there are tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of atoms um, inside of a, a, a hunk of polonium that we might actually be able to see. I mean, polonium 211 uh, in 211 grams, that'd be about 0.2 kilograms. There, there are 6.02 times 10 to the 31 atoms um, that all can go through, that all end up going through this process. That's a lot of atoms. Whenever you add up all of those atoms going through this decay, you actually get out a lot of energy.
Now we've done one uh, problem involving alpha decay uh, whenever we were actually going through and kind of going over the information. So let's do now one with beta decay. Uh, so we're going to determine the amount of energy released when tritium, which is an isotope, uh, isotope of hydrogen, has two neutrons, one proton, so um, a uh, nucleon number of three, uh, undergoes beta decay. So we need to start out by actually writing out our balanced nuclear equation, right, for beta decay, which we would have tritium, would end up decaying into a helium, releasing a beta particle, and an antineutrino. Um, now, the bar over the top of that V there indicates that it's antimatter, but that, that, that's not something that's overly important to us right now. Uh, and, and the mass of the, um, the antineutrino is uh, so small uh, that, that we don't even need to include it in our calculations here. Now, um, to find the actual amount of energy released, let's find the mass defect. I'm going to do that by subtracting the reactants minus the products. And the only product that you have to deal with a beta decay is actually going to be the other major, uh, the, the other major isotope. You don't have to include the mass of the antineutrino. It's so small that you don't even have to worry about it. And this mass of the electron uh, is actually going to end up being included in, in the mass uh, of, of this guy. Here's why. The, the mass that we look up uh, for helium-3, that guy's rest mass there, uh, automatically comes with a full set of electrons, which for helium would have two, two electrons to offset the two protons. But whenever you go through this decay, it's not like an electron all of a sudden appears out there in the orbital, uh, out there in the orbitals for some odd reason. And, and so what, what we end up doing is we, we recognize that the mass of these two guys combined uh, is going to end up being the mass that we find for the helium nucleus. Long story short, you can neglect, in this case, the mass of the, the, mass of the electron as well. And whenever you, whenever you subtract those two masses, you end up with a mass defect of uh, 0 0.00002 AMUs, or, or if we were going to put that in scientific notation, uh, 2.0 times 10 to the negative uh, fifth AMUs. And then that, that's a very, very small um, mass defect. They're very, very small mass defect between those. But, but um, let's go ahead and convert that to energy, and then we'll talk about uh, the amount of energy that actually can come out of this reaction. Remember, whenever you want to go uh, to energy, we'll just jump straight to joules in this case for our sake. Um, we're going to multiply this 2.0 times 10 to the negative fifth AMUs, and if you prefer to leave it in, in the decimal format, that's fine, um, times my 1.5 times 10 to the negative 10th joules per AMU. So I'm multiplying by 1.5 times 10 to the negative 10th, which gives me a 3.0 times 10 to the negative 15th joules would actually be released per a beta decay of a tritium nucleus. Now, once again, that seems like a very, very small amount of energy, but, but whenever you actually uh, recognize that in uh, just about three grams of, uh, of, of tritium, th there are 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd uh, atoms or isotopes there. Uh, so whenever you actually, if you let three grams of tritium all go through beta decay, now it does take a long time. Tritium has a has half-life, if I remember correctly, about 12 years. But over those, over the time that it takes for it to, for all of that to decay, uh, you would actually end up releasing from just about three grams of tritium somewhere just, just a little bit less of two billion joules, just because of how many atoms there are actually each releasing this little bit of energy with each beta decay. All right, let's summarize how to work all of these problems. Whenever you have one of these problems, write yourself a balanced nuclear equation, subtract the products, or excuse me, the reactants, minus the products to find your mass defect, or how much, how much energy was actually released. Go ahead and convert that uh, energy in, or convert that mass defect, which actually is the mass of the energy that's being released. Uh, calculate that in terms of energy by simply, if you want to get to joules, multiply your AMUs times 1.5 times 10 to the negative 10th to see how much energy is released per, uh, per uh, decay.